Hi again everyone. In this video I'm going to discuss how to integrate over curves and the integrals involved are referred to as line integrals. Now a good question here is why would you want to integrate over a curve? Well there are many applications and um, they include the calculation of work done by a force in moving an object over a curve. We can also use um, these line integrals to determine the total mass and the center of mass of thin wires or thin springs. And we can also calculate the flux or the flow rate over closed curves. Now, when we integrate over curves, when we use line integrals, these are just extensions of the integrals that you would have seen at, at high school. So we'll, we'll work through these two examples um, systematically. Notice that in the first ex, uh, part A, I've got a function that is a real valued function. And in the second part, I've got a function that is a vector field or a vector valued function. So each kind of um, integral requires a slightly uh, different approach. So let's have a look. Firstly, before we, uh, let, let, let's have a look at A, and then um, I'll introduce some notation. Here I've got a function of two variables. C, the curve that I'm going to integrate over, is the unit circle with center at the origin, radius 1. We're asked to compute this line integral. So what we mean by this notation here is the integral of f over the curve C. And the ds um, means that we're integrating with respect to the arc length. Now, from a computational point of view, this is how we mostly evaluate a line integral. We introduce a vector function of one variable, r of t. We evaluate f along that and multiply through by this um, magnitude of this uh, derivative dt. So let me put that into some context for you. Let's draw, say, the unit circle with center at the origin in the xy plane. Now I know that the equation for this unit circle is just x squared plus y squared plus 1. Now what we're going to do is describe the circle using a vector function of one variable. So think of P being any point on the unit circle. That point has a position vector. Now, if I think of the position vector as x comma y or xi plus yj, then for this picture, I can introduce a variable t and just by a little bit of trig, I know that x is cosine t and y is sine t. Now, if I let t vary from 0 to 2 pi, what happens is p will travel around the curve and back to where it started. So the vector will just sort of trace out the curve as we go. Okay, so this vector function parameterizes or describes the curve under consideration. Now, to verify that, of course, you know, you can start with this and go, okay, well, let x equal cosine t, y equal sine t, and show that the equation holds. Okay, well, you can see up here, the a and b would be my limits of integration on my t. So t would be 0, uh, a would be 0, and t would be 2 pi. So what do I need? Well, I want to evaluate f along my parameterization and multiply through by the magnitude or the length of this derivative. Okay, well, along my curve, all I really do to um, work out this is let's go up and replace x with cosine t y with sine t. So I'm going to get um, cosine t 
plus sine t. Let's work out the derivative of r and then calculate its magnitude. So to calculate this derivative I go to my r and I differentiate the component function. So if I differentiate cosine t I'm going to get minus sine t and if I differentiate sine t I'll get cosine t. Now the magnitude of this derivative vector function, all I do is I take each component, I square it, and add it and take the square root. So when I square this, I'll get sine squared t, and I add cosine squared t, and I can use sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, so this will just be 1. Now, for this particular example, this is 1. Sometimes this isn't a constant, sometimes this is a function uh, of t. So, let's use this. We want to multiply this by 1 and then integrate with respect to t from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so these are my limits of integration. It's just going to be this times 1. Now, when I integrate cosine t from 0 to 2 pi, I'll get 0, because the areas cancel each other out. When I integrate sine t from 0 to 2 pi, I'll also get 0, because the areas cancel each other out. So, the value of this is actually 0. Alright, well that's how you evaluate it. You can see that parameterization, the derivative vector, the magnitude, and of course f evaluated along the, the parameterization, and then just, just integrate with respect to the, the t values. But what have I calculated? Well, we know that integrals can be used to calculate the area. If we think of this function here, think of the z positive z-axis coming out of the plane, uh, out of the uh, page at you, so we've got like a three-dimensional setup going on. Well, the, the, the graph associated with this, this surface, is the plane z equals x plus y. Now, that cuts the xy plane at, along this line, y equals minus x, and in three-dimensional space, this x squared plus y squared equals 1, is a cylinder. So a cylinder that's wrapped around the z-axis. So that plane is going to come and cut that cylinder. And let's say instead of integrating around the whole curve, I was just integrating over this half of the curve. Right? I'll get like a wedge with a curved wall or a curved side. And the, the value of the line integral over that part would be the area of the curved wall that lies above the xy plane and below this this surface here. Okay, now um, it's just because of symmetry that uh, you know uh, the for, for our problem here the two areas actually cancel when you when you integrate over around over the whole thing. So that's why we actually get a, a value of zero here. So loosely speaking, you can think of this as computing area of a curved wall, or a curved fence if you like. Okay, let's have a look at the second question. Here we've got a vector field, so you, you plug in a value for x and a value for y, and you get out a vector. Now we've got the same curve C as before, it's the unit circle with uh, centre at the origin, but to, to, eva to do line integrals involving vector fields we really need some sort of orientation on our curve. Now we're told that the orientation is anti-clockwise and we're asked to compute this line integral. Well, what does this line integral mean? Okay, well... Essentially from a computational point of view It's similar to part A, but remember this is a vector. And so instead of multiplying through by the magnitude of the this derivative, what we do is we have this dot product here or scalar product. Okay? 
So let's look back and see what we can um, use from part A. Well, when we say a curve is oriented by, in this case, an anti-clockwise rotation, what we mean is as T increases, we want the curve to be traced out in, in this case, an anti-clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Now, it turns out that this parameterization gives us the, the right orientation that we, that we want. Okay, so let's keep this parameterization. We've already computed this tangent vector. So all we really need to do is evaluate f along my parameterization and take this dot product and then do the integral. Okay, so f uh, along r of t, here's my, my f, so I re replace x with cosine t, y with sine t in here. Okay, now up here I've written i's and j's. I'm just going to write it as a, an ordered double here, just to save a little bit of space. So I'm going to have minus sine t plus 1, comma, cosine t. So, our line integral then, we've got the same bounds on our t. It's going to be this dotted with the tangent derivative vector, so it's just that. So, Okay, so essentially I want to expand this and then do the integral. Now, when I expand this, it's this component times this component plus this component times this component. Now you can see, hopefully, that when I expand this, I'm going to get a positive sine squared, I'm going to get a positive cosine squared, and I'm going to get a minus sine. So if I use cos squared plus sine squared equals 1, I'll get the following. Okay, so... Just like before, when I integrate sine t from 0 to 2 pi, that's 0 because the areas cancel. So I'm just basically integrating 1. Okay, so I've got a, a, an answer there, 2 pi. Notice that it's a number rather than a vector. But what does it represent? Well, essentially the line integral for vector functions gives you a, a measure of how well the vector field matches up with this this tangent vector okay if the if the angle between r dash and your vector field f is small then um, it, it's a good match and this and this number will will reflect that by being um, large and positive okay well that's a little bit on how to um, evaluate these line integrals but let's look at the bigger picture for a moment so suppose I have a smooth curve C by that I mean you can form a parameterization function R of T such that the derivative is never the zero vector and the derivative is continuous then this is how we compute the actual um, line integral for scalar valued functions and if you have a smooth curve with some orientation, in our case it was a counterclockwise direction, then the line integral of, of the vector field f over c is related back to your um, line integral here through the following dot product. Now, from a computational point of view, this is essentially what we use. But what does this mean here? Well, essentially, let's say you've got a curve. Okay, that's your C. And it's a smooth curve and it's oriented. You can form some sort of unit tangent vector to the curve. And 
let's say this is your F, what you can do is form a little right angle triangle. Now, this length here, the length of this side here, is this dot product. So essentially what you're doing here is you're integrating this length around the curve. Okay? But from a practical point of view, this is actually what we use. Now here are a couple of examples for you to try. They're very similar to um, the ones that I've just done. Now you can see that um, sometimes I've used the I, I and J notation, sometimes I've just used um, the uh, ordered double notation like this. Uh, both are acceptable, but have a go at these and see how you go.